All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, hope you're enjoying uh, your food. Um, my name is Guzo. I'm Associate Director of Program Design here with the Rebooting Social Media Institute at the Berkman Klein Center. I welcome you all to the, uh, the center. Uh, today we have a very exciting uh, panel, uh, an issue that for me is very close to my heart, which is uh, disinformation uh, and misinformation. And um, before we start the panel, I'd love to introduce uh, our moderator, who is uh, Paulo Carvão. Paulo is a global technology executive with a record of uh, leading large businesses at IBM, um, he, uh, where he was a senior leadership team member until 2022. Since then, he has acted as a strategic advisor for technology and go-to market issues, and is a venture capital limited partner an investment, investment committee member. During his social impact fellowship at the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, Paulo is focusing on the intersection of technology and democracy. Paulo, hope we have many other events as you as a moderator, but for now, I pass it on to you. Thank you so much for organizing this. Today and uh, for those of you on the, on the webcast, uh, you're welcome to our disinformation uh, panel. Uh, I hope we'll have an uh, exciting next 40 to 45 minutes of prepared remarks, and uh, then we'll have ample time at the end for Q and A, both here as well as on the on the web. As Guzo mentioned, during my fellowship here at Harvard, I'm focusing on this intersection between technology and democracy, especially especially the role that social media artificial intelligence have in uh, generating radicalization, polarization, and uh, in doing so, eroding some of uh, the democratic institutions. So uh, I wanted to set the context uh, for the panel. Uh, we, uh, uh, first I wanted to acknowledge that social media is a vehicle for uh, political action, from uh, providing a voice for the oppressed or for minorities, all the way on the more kind of a negative side of things, potentially generating misinformation and uh, misinformation. Also, uh, Brazil is uh, a very large market for social media. Uh, I hope that we can learn some of uh, from what happened there. Uh, and this would be a guide also as we embark in our own election cycle here in the US. To give you uh, some perspective and some uh, uh, view of uh, you know, how large this market is, uh, today it is considered the fourth or fifth uh, depending on whether we include China or not, uh, market in, in the world. It's only behind uh, China, India, US, and Indonesia in this order. Uh, we have about uh, 160 uh, million users. Uh, this represents about uh, three quarters of the population in the country. Uh, the statistics of uh, usage uh, are basically that uh, about uh, 82% of these users report daily usage. And uh, when you focus only on adults uh, and people of the voting uh, age, uh, this goes up to uh, 92%. So it's everybody's uh, constantly on this. The largest applications are in this order, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. So you see there's a clustering around the, the meta uh, properties. The uh, in uh, and this is a pretty recent statistic as of uh, July of this year. Uh, Ninety-two percent. Uh, 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 sorry, actually, seventy-nine percent of those surveyed uh, use internet and social media as their main source of news. Uh, the second source of news. Uh, for the overall population is television with 51%. So 79% use 
social media and the internet as the main source of use, and second, uh, television with uh, 51%. And uh, uh, we have had a, a presidential election last year. Uh, the current president was elected with 50.9% uh, of the votes. Uh, the one who lost the election uh, lost with 49.1%. So as you can see, it was a very contested election, very close election. And if we fast forward to today, uh, this 50-50 split is still a very good uh, you know, picture of the situation in the country and uh, how polarized uh, things are. So this is uh, kind of basically the, uh, the context of uh, what's going on. I wanted to introduce our uh, great panelists today to give them, you a little bit of their, their background and I'll go through kind of the sequence of what we're going to cover. And uh, is this on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. And so first, uh, uh, Maria Eduarda Jassis, she's a lawyer and a policy advisor with expertise in public and digital security. She works at Instituto Igarapé in Brazil. She uh, has graduated from the University of the State of Rio. It's considered one of the premier uh, law schools in the, in the country. Uh, as a criminal lawyer, has also a master's degree in human rights public policies at the Federal University of uh, Rio and is currently a uh, LLM candidate at NYU University here in, in New York. Uh, but most importantly, she is one of the co-authors of the Disinformation Pulse, which is uh, the report that I will kind of dissect in a, in a few minutes. Uh, we have Natalia Viana. She is a co-founder and executive uh, director of Agência Pública, which is Brazil's largest non-profit investigative journalist, uh, journalism uh, outlet. Uh, she leads uh, long-term investigations and multimedia projects about human rights violations, and her team has won more than 70 awards for excellence in journalism. Uh, she, in 2022, was a Neiman Fellow here at Harvard and uh, dedicated her time uh, to uh, investigate uh, misinformation, bringing together her knowledge from both journalism as well as uh, some academic uh, you know, background to this. Uh, Natalia has led uh, the coverage of the Brazil elections and their aftermath, uh, including uh, and primarily from an angle of disinformation and misinformation. She's a um, board member at the Gabo Foundation. It's an organization founded by the Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez and dedicated for uh, betterment of the journalists. And she is also in the board of the Center for Media Integrity of the Organization of American States. And uh, finally, we have David Niemer. He is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Media Studies and Anthropology at the University of Virginia. Uh, he is also the director of the Latin American Studies there. Uh, he is the author of uh, two books, Favela Digital, The Other Side of Technology from 2013, and then recently in 2022, uh, Technology of the Oppressed. He was a visiting scholar here at the Berkman Klein Center in 22-23 academic year. He, owe, he holds a Master of Arts in Anthropology from the University of Virginia, a Master of Science in Computer Science from Saarland University, and a PhD in Computing Culture and Society from Indiana uh, University. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, first do that is going to uh, provide us a factual baseline of what happened in Brazil. Uh, then uh, Natalia will uh, uh, discuss a little bit of the af aftermath of what happened and uh, uh, go deeper into uh, the role of some international organizations in generating this misinformation and disinformation. And David will bring us home with a discussion of the legacy behind this, uh, including uh, a bill that is currently in Brazilian Congress uh, to uh, potentially regulate some of this, this activity and draw some parallels between uh, you know, the constitutional structure, the judicial system, and uh, the reality between Brazil and the uh, United States. And uh, as I mentioned, this should leave us ample time for a live Q&A here or uh, with you uh, uh, on the webcast. Okay, so uh, do that, uh, take it away. Good afternoon to all. Is it working? Yeah. 
Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Bergman Klein Center for hosting this event today, and in particular, uh, the facilitation of Paulo and the participation of my colleagues, Natalia and David. Uh, let me also extend my gratitude for Ireland and the Stability Fund for supporting this report that I will present in just a bit. And uh, as by way of introduction, the Garapé Institute is a think-and-do tank focused on the areas of public, digital, and climate security, and its objective is to propose solutions and partnerships for global challenges. But let's get to the topic that we are here to discuss, which is a 21st century challenge that we are living not only in Brazil, but indeed in every, every country in the world. Uh, this is a threat of digital harms, and by that I mean misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation mobilized by an economy fueled by clicks, and how these harms can threat our democracies nowadays. So, in the next slide, uh, as Paulo already introduced, Brazil is a profoundly digitalized society, so whether we like it or not, the social and political debates that are preoccupying the majority of Brazilians nowadays are filtered through social media. And I don't know if we are remotely ready for this challenge and to manage the ways in which a small group can hijack our conversation and how uh, the, this radical decentralization in our communication is happening. So at the Institute, we've been studying the ways in which social media are being, uh, are being mobilized by all actors in 2014, 2018, and 2022 to better understand the ways these informations are corroding our democratic values. We've been studying to how institutions and civil society groups are responding to these harms. And you can find our report here. So, uh, Brazil is an extraordinary laboratory for understanding both the threats as well as the responses to digital harms. But these digital harms, they are not occurring in a vacuum. Uh, they coincide with a 15-year low faith in democracy in Latin America. And there are many explanations uh, for this downward trend in support for democracy. Frustration with political elites to deliver, uh, persistent inequality, low wages, low economic growth, as well as high levels of corruption and crimes. All these issues come to mind. But what our research shows is that digital harms are amplifying this content, sharpening biases, shifting behavior, both online and offline. And what we saw in the last couple of years in Brazil and elsewhere is that many of political leaders are leveraging their position to target leg the legitimacy and integrity of uh, electoral processes and democratic institutions. They don't just reduce support for democracy, but they also, also can intensify this anti-democratic sentiment. And this can partly help to explain why we are seeing the rise of many authoritarian and populist leaders all over the world. And as part of our research, we focus on our analysis on four dominant uh, disinformation narratives seeking to reduce trust in elections, target democratic institutions, discredit and diminish the influence of opponents, and, in, and influence supporters to mobilize and take actions on false pretenses. Our research focused on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as TikTok, WhatsApp, Telegram, and Twitter. And between August and October of 2022, we found that there was a fairly even distribution of disinformation narratives. And that, what I will show you now is a representative sample of narratives to give you a sense of their content and form. Overall, we found that narratives seeking to reduce trust in the electoral system tended to be most common, as we can see in green. But here, um, we further subdivided these four narrative categories into over 20 sub-narratives. In the interest of, of time, I'll just briefly point a few top-line findings. Let's start with the sub-narrative sub -narrative falling under election, the electoral system. And the most common targets here we detected were the TSC and election machines. And this tended to grow over the election period, often in response to decisions made by the TSC 
and uh, the SDF. Well, the next one. Okay, with, just uh, to uh, for those that are uh, not sure. familiar with the uh, with the acronym, TSC is the Electoral Court in Brazil. Yes, it's our Superior Electoral Court, and the SDF that I'll present for today is our Supreme Court. And as for narratives uh, targeting democratic institutions, the key targets were the judiciary as a whole, often accusing of favoring the left, as well as our Supreme Court. And the next narrative regarding attacks against political opponents, we see not just the far right, but also the left uh, using these tactics. And many narratives on the left sought to discredit Bolsonaro and his allies accusing them of everything from fascism to corruption and genocide, for example. But the far right were more, far more more active than the, the left in spreading this information uh, all over social media, targeting the traditional media, accusing Lula of everything from authoritarianism, drug trafficking, satanism, satanism pedophilia, and more. And finally, the last narrative, uh, we focus on this information used to sway supporters. Some of the most, sub most popular sub-narratives uh, cast the election as an existential struggle of good versus evil. They threatened that Lula would impose communism, uh, dictatorship, suppress uh, religious freedom, and spread gender and identity-based ideologies in primary schools, for example. And the next slide. Uh, the analysis of posts and interactions on social media showed superior performance and engagement among far-right groups in almost all social media frameworks and networks. Here, I'll use uh, Facebook's example, but the same trend uh, will be repeated on Twitter and Instagram. When we look at the volumetric metrics of political content, we found that the far right was not necessarily producing more content, as we can see in the graphic on the top, but getting far more content engagement, as we can see in the graphic below. They outpaced the left, the center, the traditional media during the months leading up and during the election period. Election period. And next slide, uh, the high volume and this rapid expansion of this information often outpaced institutions and platforms working to remove offending content. And this can partly be explained by this fluidity uh, between platforms. And that's because the nature of narratives that emerge on each platform is kind of different. While more objective messages are shared on Twitter with limited and more shallow content, the same narratives may take on more detail and density on YouTube, uh, where more elaborate posts are shared. Uh, following the flow, cuts of videos on Facebook and YouTube reach a TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and WhatsApp to highlight more appealing speeches. And digital harms, next slide, please. Uh, and digital harms, including aggressive discourse and hate speech, can contribute to intimidation, harassment, and even the outbreak of physical violence. One of the most extreme effects of some digital harms is to intensify support for non-democratic transitions of power. We've seen in Brazil, as well as in the US, how they can supercharge protest movements and empower extreme voices, including those opposed to democratic forms of government. The spread of this information, proliferations of conspiracy, and the rising acceptance of non-democratic solutions culminated with the failed January 8th insurrection not that long ago in Brazil. And the point is that this information channeled by a tiny handful of influencers and bots can effectively mobilize a faction of partisans with devastating effects. Next slide. But if there is any good news, I think we can learn much about how Brazil uh, responded to this information in recent years. We have seen Brazilian institutions, particularly the judiciary, pushing back against digital harms and helping to detect, deter, and remove ill-intentioned content from social media. And there are many examples, which I'll not, not have the time to reveal in detail, but they are all listed in our report. One is the program to combat disinformation set up by the TSE with more than 150 partners. 
Another is the Observatory of Election Transparency, set up by the TSC2, made up of civil society institutions, including the Igarapé Institute. And as I mentioned, the judiciary has been particularly active, especially the SCF, our Supreme Court, and the TSC, our electoral court. One reason for this is likely because this court themselves has been the target of many attacks, but it also underlines the resilience of our institutions. And, uh, but I, I think this more assertive judicial approach also in moderating social media also raised a lot of concerns and exacerbated this uh, political polarization in Brazil. And that can also be considered as a cautionary tale of how the lack of regulation about this thing can be an invitation to arbitrariness. And uh, what we can say is that all of these initiatives, they are still a work in progress, and there are significant tensions balancing, preventing and detecting this information while also maintaining freedom of expression. And there is a risk, as many will say, that the disease could be in some cases worse than the, the cure, the cure, no, the cure could be in some cases worse than the disease. So how do we deal with these challenges? Well, I think the point here is that digital harms are not going away any anytime soon. In an era of intense computational potency and increasing AI potency too, we're going to see an increase in the frequency, intensity, and complexity of digital harms. These are the negative externalities of digital commons. And of course, digital harms cannot be prevented and reduced through digital means alone. We will need to see much more engagement from the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. And at minimum, we need to see more accountability from the platform, which of course will require regulation. And But more fundamentally and beyond legal approaches, I think reducing digital harms such as disinformation requires addressing underlying polarizations and all the structural, structural factors that drive it, such as social equity issues and economic inequality. And what is more, tackling it, it requires a step change level in, of engagement in addressing uh, awareness, education, and inoculation strategies. And I, of course, I look forward to explore all of these, not just in the interest of safeguarding democracy in Brazil, but also sharing lessons for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Luda. Uh, and, uh... Kind of the strange thing is this probably was not a coincidence, right? And Natalia, I think you have a, a point of view of uh, what was happening behind the scenes. Yeah? Yes. Thank you very much, Paulo. Thank you, Julian, David, and thank you so much for being here to listen to our, <laughs> our rendition of what happened in Brazil. Hello. Um, okay. To our rendition of what happened to Brazil, I've been talking about that in Paulo. It's very important that the U.S. listens to what happened in Brazil because uh, the responses were different, but not only the strategies were similar, they were organized together. This is what I'm going to talk about. So on January 8th, about 4,000 Bolsonaro supporters invaded the buildings of the three powers of Brazil, the government, Congress, and the Supreme Court. The raiders were highly organized. They had light weapons, and in their heads, they were protesting a fraudulent election and requesting that the military took over to reestablish law and order. They were doing the right thing. Their actions were the result of a multi-year disinformation campaign led by Jair Bolsonaro, his sons, his vice president, who is an army general, his pres vice president candidate, who is an army general, and other close allies. This disinformation campaign aimed at creating an alternative narrative about the election fraud, which convinced many people, including in important places. Recently, we learned that the Navy commander, the commander of the Navy of Brazil, for example, said he would accept a coup attempt. This was a disinformation field attempt to grab power, to keep power, the second one in our continent in just two years. It is a new phenomenon that journalists, academics, and lawmakers have to analyze deeper, and it is a consequence of the digital transformation of politics and society. Now, our role, the role of investigative journalists, is to find the factual links 
the connection between connections between individuals and follow the money to find where the how these campaigns are being financed. We looked at the human infrastructure, which is a term that I I use from my friend David Neymar. So to do this, we combine traditional investigation methods such as doorstepping and tracking campaign expenses and online investigations. So it, it includes mapping, uh, mapping influence, uh, hashtag analysis, investigative profiles to see if they are fake or not, if there is a bot network, and etc. Us at Agencia Pública, the investigative now news outlet that I lead, that I lead, we have investigated and uncovered several networks that were operating to spread this information throughout the Bolsonaro government. Many of them were fueled by public funds and were directly related to not only the Bolsonaro family but also congressmen and congresswomen. Uh, we also worked on understanding the connection between Bolsonaros, the Bolsonaros, and the American far right. Now, by studying and comparing the, the strategies taken by Donald Trump to undermine trust in the US election and by Bolsonaro, we found at least 15 tactics that were directly imported from the US, basically copied from Trump, such as, for instance, um, using government institutions to promote a narrative of fraud. And we all know, in Brazil, we all know, Bolsonaro famously held a meeting uh, last July with foreign ambassadors to tell them that the elections could be rigged. This backfired, thankfully. Other strategies imported included efforts to block voting in opposition majority areas, calling for supporters to act as election inspectors, refusing to accept an unfavorable outcome even before the elections, claims to, uh, uh, urging the, the, Supreme, uh, the electoral court to stop the vote count, legal battles to revert the results after the result was done, and the vast use of misinfographics, which are mis misleading technical information about how votes are counted and probabilities of winning. This is, was copied from the US and used in Brazil. This shows that there was an international coalition around this exchange. Also in Brazil, um, the Bolsonaro family, oh, no, another thing before. Also in Brazil, it was very important, the influencers from the US were very important to spread the story about electoral fraud because right after the elections, the electoral court and the Supreme Court were already repressing the Brazilian influencers. So the misinformation spread abroad mainly. Um, the Bolsonaro family has spent immense time and effort to build alliances in the United States. Eduardo Bolsonaro met Steve Bannon on August 2018. Months afterwards, he was named the South American representative of the movement, which is Bannon's platform for, for the populist right. He visited and met three uh, key Trump allies more than 80 times in four years. He founded his own conservative institute in Brazil that helped to create a Brazilian version of the CPAC, a pro-Trump conservative political action conference. So he's mimicking how the far right organizes here in the US, in Brazil. And he was in Washington on the eve of the Capitol attack and met key Trump supporters during those days, including Ivanka, Jared Kushner, and my pillow CEO, Mike Lindell. Now, Bolsonaro's allies celebrated and defended the Capitol riot in Brazilian social media, so they spread in Portuguese Trump's big lie, and in turn, Trump's allies, such as Tucker Carlson, Mike, uh, uh, Matthew Tierman, Jason Miller, Ali Alexander, and Steve Bannon, all spread the lies about uh, Brazilian uh, fraud in the Brazilian elections to a wider international audience. Right after Bolsonaro's defeat in October 2022, Eduardo flew to the US, met Donald Trump, met Trump Jr., met Jason Miller, and, and met uh, Steve Bannon, and also um, Jason Miller from a uh, social media platform Getter, according to Bannon. They were talking about how should the reaction be. It is important to note that this articulation happens at the margins of any official channels. The main conduits for this articulation of the far left were the likes of the CPAC, this conservative uh, conference, social media companies like Getter, and Steve Bannon and his network of relationships. It is also worth noting that Jair Bolsonaro was in the US during the January 8 uh, riots. But also, we should also note that other political operatives from Latin America also engaged in the same campaign to discredit the Brazilian elections. 
So only four days after the defeat, an Argentinian political marketeer called Fernando Cerimedo did a live broadcast on his uh, right-wing newspaper called La Derecha Diario, in which he said he had obtained a dossier by private individuals that revealed voter fraud. He said that a number of other models of electronic voting machines were used in the Brazilian elections. This was broadcast from Argentina. It was a lie. His claims were debunked by the fact-checking agencies, news outlets, and the Brazilian Electoral Court. But it was live-streamed and watched by over 400,000 people. And it became one of the main pieces of propaganda in the aftermath of the elections. Together with his live stream, uh, an apocryphal, uh, uh, apocryphal, I don't know how to say this, dossier went viral and started being shared in Bolsonaro's uh, 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 social media. Now, this person, Serimedo, he's now a marketeer for far right candidate Javier Milei, so he's also behind the Milei campaign. And it is also, it is then not by chance that Thurston Carlson, the for, former Fox News presenter, went to Argentina to interview Milei. Uh, so here's a warning. If Millet loses the elections in Argentina, buckle up because we probably may see a wave of claims of rigged elections and maybe a new capital attack. We've heard that in the first round of the Argentinian elections, there was already a threat of a bomb in the, in the, their White House, the Pink House. So, uh, these kind of strategies are not dead. Right now, they're playing out in Argentina. Now, a couple of notes about the aftermath uh, and how the Supreme Court acted. Uh, the Supreme Court, Court overstretched a little bit its powers to reframe the coup, uh, but it was super important for Brazil. Uh, in every step of the multi-step plan that I mentioned here, some of the steps, the Supreme Court managed to counteract by many measures. So, for instance, they advanced in a couple of days the certification of Lula's win which was not foreseen, but because there were already like some talks about uh, protesting in Brasilia. Uh, they find Bolsonaro's party for attempting malicious lawsuit. They suspended social media, media for many influencers, um, including ministers and congressmen, which wasn't heard of before. Uh, over 2,000 people were arrested, uh, over 500 are charged with federal crimes. And uh, the electoral court now barred Bolsonaro from running to office until 2030, due to that meeting that I mentioned <laughs> with the foreign ambassadors. Of course, the the capital invasion here in the U.S. had happened two years before, so the, the Supreme Court had some time to organize and to look ahead, knowing that something very similar could happen. So uh, this. Also, NGOs and the Electoral Court organized a very strong international response ahead of what we all knew could happen. But even though justice was swifter in Brazil, this does not mean that the misinformation campaign to subvert, to subvert democracy is over. Bolsonaro's allies, as much as Trump's, are fomenting versions of him being a, a political persecuted person and that there is widespread censorship in our uh, social media. So the battle is very far from over. And it's, uh, it's important to note how uh, institutions and civil society in Brazil reacted to that, right? So I think this is a good transition, David, to you. And uh, what's been like the legacy of every, everything that has happened and uh, you know, how, how this compares to uh, what could happen here also? Thank you. I don't, can you guys hear me? I don't think the microphone is. Yeah. No? All right. Yeah. Um, just one side note. Uh, Tucker Carlson invited Millet to be on his show, and then Millet said that he hates communism, so he's going to break ties with China and Putin in Russia. So little does he know that uh, Tucker Carlson is one of the biggest Russian propagandists in the West. It was interesting to see uh, Tucker Carlson's face as he had to agree with Millet that Putin was a communist. Anyways. Uh, so I was given the task here by Paolo to compare the U.S. and Brazil from a legal and a constitutional perspective, which I'm happy to do here. But just a disclaimer, I'm not a legal scholar. So my goal here is not to present an legal analysis, but rather to show how the current state of Brazil's legal system facilitated the following actions regarding this information and the attacks on January 8th and lead us to the so-called fake news bill 
that is currently in Congress to be voted. Just for context, Brazil's Supreme Court is composed of 11 justices, while in the US, we have nine. Uh, in Brazil, there's a mandatory retirement age of 75 years. It is not a lifetime appointment as we, have, we see here in the United States. But the most impressive difference is the number of cases that each court considers. In 2020, Brazil Supreme Court heard about 90,000 cases, while the US Supreme Court hears around 100 cases a year. So this high number is due to the Constitution of 1988, with its more than 200 articles and 80 amendments, allowing almost any matter to be brought up uh, before the Supreme Court. Another peculiarity of Brazil's judicial system is the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court's branch called the Superior Electoral Court, which is responsible for coordinating electoral work in the country and carry out the certification of the president and vice president of the republic. So on March 14th of 2019, Brazil's Supreme Court opened an investigation aimed at, quote, investigating the existence of fake news, slanderous reports, threats, and copyright violations. Those were infractions that may constitute slander, defamation, and insult against the members of the Supreme Court and their families. So Supreme Justice Alexandre de Moraes was appointed to preside over it. Uh, this was called the fake news inquiry. But the question that comes up is, how was the Supreme Court allowed to investigate and judge the case in which it was the victim? So according to Article 41 of the Internal Regulations of the Supreme Court, if a crime, if a criminal event occurs within the court's own premises, the court is given the power of investigating, investigating it because in theory, it is the most interest in unraveling the criminal action and has the closest knowledge of the act. Uh, this raises doubts since criminal investigation is, is a responsibility of the judiciary police and exceptionally the public prosecutor's office. So in the absence of proper regulation to deal with this information and online orchestration to delegitimize democracy, the country relied on the Supreme Court's uh, fake news inquiry to take down malicious content, ban social media accounts, and arrest people whose intentions were to harm the electoral system in the country. So several acts led by Justice uh, Alexandre de Moraes were questioned due to their borderline authoritarian tone and some even call them unconstitutional. However, the Supreme Court has been able to demonstrate how its approach not only kept democracy intact during the elections and transition of power, but also stayed within the constitutional boundaries. Um, even though Brazil's Supreme Court has uh, had this active role during, the, during and after the elections, with, which was something that uh, we didn't see in the Supreme Court here in the United States. It felt like the Supreme Court here was not seeing what was going on with the so-called big lie claims. Uh, Brazil was still bombarded with uh, misinformation as presented by Duda, uh, leading to the attacks of January 8th as presented by Natalia. So these attacks were classified as domestic terrorist acts, along with several school shootings that happened in the country all coordinated on online platforms, there was a major call for proper regulations of big tech companies in Brazil. So the Brazilian Cham Chamber of Deputies, the lower house of the Congress, is currently considering the so-called fake news bill, which goes way beyond the issue of misinformation and attempts to regulate social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, or now X, and messaging apps such as WhatsApp and Telegram. Uh, the bill compels telecom providers to take action against disinformation, it strengthens the transparency of sponsored online content, and outlines uh, the procedures by which state authorities can penalize non-compliant companies. It primarily targets major tech companies operating in three categories, social networking sites, search engines and public instant messaging apps with over 10 million registered active users in the country. So basically the major big tech companies that are present in Brazil. So although the main objective of the bill is to enhance transparency on social media platforms and 
and private messaging apps. Uh, and it has the goal to contain and combat the spread of misinformation. It also has the potential to modernize some of the internet laws established in Brazil, which was called the Civil Rights Framework for the Internet, which in Portuguese was translated, uh, the name is Marco Civil da Internet. So Brazil does have an internet constitution or an internet law. However, that was voted and approved in 2014. So the internet has changed a lot since then. So there's a call to renew um, some, of, some of its main points. So I'm just going to lay out four main points that are somewhat uh, polemic, but it's worth noting. So one deals with content moderation. Um, Article 15 of the bill outlines that social media platforms are required to establish content moderation guidelines that provide users with the right of reply and disclosure of the um, moderation's motives and profiles. Public agent and parliamental uh, privilege. This one's very uh, polemic as well, as it says that the bill recognizes that social media accounts of political figures, such as the president, governors, mayors, and legislators, to be of public interest. As per the proposal, these accounts cannot restrict other accounts from accessing their posts. I think we had this issue of Donald Trump banning people on his Twitter account and people fighting to have access to it because he was a, 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 a public person of interest. But this proposal, um, it claims that these accounts cannot restrict other accounts from accessing their posts. For example, the bill prohibits public officials from blocking other accounts and users thus restricting access to publications. And also it gives uh, a parliamentary privilege because in the constitution, uh, governors and folks in the public office, they do have some privilege in terms of investigation. So it would allow them to share misinformation or disinformation without facing any sort of repercussion or uh, content moderation from the platform. So they would have some sort of uh, privilege which misses the point because as we know uh, most people in office especially those in the far right are the key hubs of distributing misinformation uh, the third point is election ads so social media platforms must disclose all paid content along with the uh, account responsible responsible for it allowing users to communicate with advertisers uh, electoral ads or content that mentions candidates, parties, or coalitions must be publicly available for review by the electoral justice. And the fourth point uh, deals with uh, news and media. This is also very controversial because, uh, for example, in Australia, there has been efforts to, to create this payment from big tech companies to journalist outlets. However, uh, I don't know if you follow this, but then Facebook didn't agree with it. And basically ban every uh, news outlet from its platform so it was not possible to access um, these online news agencies from within the platforms so basically uh, you know the fake news bill states that providers must must compensate media outlets for the use of their uh, journalistic content um, this has been taken off of the bill that is going through congress right now but it's certainly something that people want to look at in the future to see how we can regulate this relationship between news agencies and uh, big tech platforms. And anyways, uh, to conclude here, the, the so-called fake news bill has raised concerns about its potential impact on freedom of speech and its effectiveness in combating the spread of misinformation. A Congressman Orlando Silva, who drafted the bill, faces significant challenge in considering the recommendations from the federal government and civil society organizations while still attempting to garner enough support from the Chamber of Deputies to best develop. So Brazil can seize the opportunity to set the, an example for the world in regulating big techs. However, the country must avoid adopting the reckless approach of move fast and break things, and instead embrace the challenge of moving accordingly and preserving society. Thank you. Thanks, David. So uh, let's open up for questions. Uh, anybody here in the room? Or uh, if you're on the webcast, you know, you can uh, ask, uh, ask your questions in the chat and I'll uh, we'll get to you. Please state your name and then 
Then the question. Hi, it's an Hi, it's Anna Pump Chandler. I'm a professor at Georgetown and a visiting scholar here at the Reap and Social Media Institute. So the question I have for all of you, but especially David, um, is with respect to the comparison between the Brazilian approach and the European approach. Um, as you know, the Digital Services Act, which has gone into effect, again, targeting uh, largely VLOPs or VLOSs, the very large big tech companies, that are operating there. There, the threshold is 10% of the European population, the EU population, and uh, your threshold is actually smaller, of 10 million people. So it's it's interesting to it might cover more uh, more companies in that in that way. But what we've seen is uh, some concern about how the DSA is being used already. Uh, we saw groups like Article 19 and EFF. Uh, joining forces to raise concerns about the letters that have been sent out to the platforms in the wake of the Israel-Gaza uh, 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 violence. Um, uh, and so I wanted to see what you thought about um, those powers that are being used in Europe uh, in this context. And so the, the concern that the um, civil liberties groups have raised is that the targeting of certain kinds of speech might be what is intended by uh, what exactly the, what the, the authorities consider disinformation uh, might, be, uh, might be open to the question. So I just wanted to see how you guys are dealing with that. Hi, uh, thank you, thank you for your question. Um, so I'm not an expert on the European regulations, but from what I read and I saw, they are trying to materialize or let's say update the current laws that they have regarding speech into the digital world, right? And how they how can they identify these sort of uh, speech in those online strategies or online posts? Like for example, in you know in Germany. You can't deny the existence of the Holocaust, right? It's not protected under free speech. Uh, and there are many ways that you can engage with that idea of denying such things on online platforms. Of course, it broadens the ways that people can be more creative and engaging with their hate speech. Uh, and that's where the tri tricky part is. Like how can you identify these things, even though uh, even you know you're trying to not hurt freedom of speech. Again, I'm not an expert on, on the European regulations, but that's what I understood that they are trying to do. They're not trying to come up with a taxonomy or classification of what counts as misinformation or disinformation, but rather they're trying to see how can they bring their own regulations on speech to the online platforms. And I think this is where Brazil is also going. So hate speech is not protected under uh, freedom of speech in Brazil. Uh, so the challenge now is actually identifying where and how these hate speech get spread through these platforms so they can combat that. And, and unfortunately, we've been uh, using the, the term fake news misinformation as an umbrella term to bring all these things together. But um, from what I know of the European context, it's mostly focused on speech that is already regulated, the same thing in Brazil. Can I, can I yes. just, I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to add something because I think David is, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't explain why the bill was stopped and this was a very violent uh, rebuff from the big tech in Brazil and I think this is very important for everybody to understand. Big tech was regulated in Australia as I mentioned, there is an attempt to regulate to make them pay for journalism also in Canada and in Brazil as well. And I was the president of the Brazilian Digital News Association, and I was part of these conversations. I was part of the negotiations that were, ha that were happening before the bill passed, before the bill was about to vote. When the bill was about to be voted two days before, uh, and there was an agreement in Congress and in government already, Google used its homepage, which is used by 92% of the Brazilians for search, to spread lies, 
Google posted two links. The first one said the fake news view is going to make it harder to understand what is true and what is not on the internet. And the second one said fake news view is going to worsen your internet. And this is like what 100% of the Brazilians use. So they created a scare. It was a huge uproar. The, the, the people who are far right allied to Bolsonaro started intervening and saying that the fake news law was actually censorship and it just clustered the entire debate. This is a set of this is a set of companies that are meddling in politics in different countries because they are against regulating. So the European approach, because Europeans are things with more time and more consideration and etc., is very positive. Nobody, no other country has been able to regulate them, and they have said very clearly that they're going to combat. They're going to muscle their way against regulation. Right now. Canada has been without news on Facebook and on Google for four months. So if you go to Google and you search what's going on in my neighborhood, there's not going to be any news sources. This is what's happening. It's very, very serious. Sorry, I'm very pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that more than uh, combat this information, uh, David is also saying, always saying like fake news bill and why it's fake news bill. Because a lot of people think that it's a bill trying to define which contents are not permitted to go online. But it's not about like saying that's true, that's false, that, that is true, that is false. It's not about it. It's like it goes beyond like we need to, it's not about only combating this information. It's about like how can we prevent it? So we need to look uh, for like digital literacy, uh, awareness, education but also increase transparency about their algorithms. So it's, it's more than making a taxonomy. We need to, to, to look at this entire environment. So that's why it's fake news view. It's not about fake news only. It's, it's much more broader than this. Thanks for that. I know uh, we have a couple questions more from the audience. Yeah, I have one. Uh, hello, my should I stand? Hello, my name is Veronica. I'm also from Brazil. I'm a recovering journalist who's now a student at the government school at the Kennedy School. And I have a question actually uh, about, uh, it's safe to say that Bolsonaro election in 2018 was, uh, uh, came a lot from the fake news environment, such as uh, in the US also, but to what extent can we, re can we really say that his non-election last year uh, could be uh, uh, could come from the efforts we were already doing and Brazil was already doing as a nation because we still don't have the bill we still don't have nothing in place to prevent that we have like very strong and uh, organizations non profits and civil society are trying to tackling that but is it uh, already can we say that we ha we we had some reflection of our uh, efforts as a society to kind of trying to fight that or not at all? Can, I don't know, what's your view on what happened of that reflection? Thank you. Anybody wants to start? Natalia? Yeah, I would love to start. Yeah. <laughs> uh, congratulations on being a <laughs> recovering journalist. <laughs> uh, I, oh, I don't think we can measure this, right? Yeah. They're the political science, we can measure this, but because we've been following all the attempts by Bolsonaro and actually listing them and seeing all the ways that the Supreme Court counteracted. Uh, what, I, what I can say is if the Supreme Court had not acted, we would be in a very much worse situation. So for instance, with the buses, you remember on the day of, in the day of the elections, when I say they sent buses to stop uh, uh, voters from the Northeast, from areas or where Lula was going to win. If nothing had been done, this would have been proceeded. There is other actions of like distributing money that were stopped. The the um, uh, there were a lot of Bolsonaristas who were spreading lies, whose content was taken off, and and the Supreme, the electoral court acted very swiftly, like in, in a very impressive way. Of course, if we had like a proper government that was taking care of <laughs> of the elections, it would be better. But the vote was so close that I do think that it had an effect. I don't know what's your opinion. And uh, evidently anything here would be a judgment, and uh, I think what is from a political and a societal perspective, what is interesting is, uh, I mentioned to you, this is a country that is 50-50.
split at this point, right? So a lot of uh, these facts as presented here could in, be interpreted in different ways, or people could have opinions about uh, what the Supreme Court had done, or you know what would have happened. So what makes you know legislating about this topic so complicated is this, right? That's how do you legislate in a way that would be factual and legally correct, while at the same time adhering to some of the normative principles in the country. So, Buzo, do we have time for one or two more questions? I know that uh, we have one in the, uh, from the audience and maybe one online. So maybe we can, uh, let's have one from the audience and then I'll try and combine with uh, uh, one or two of the, the ones that we have online here. Hello? Yeah, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for the for the talk. It was super interesting. My name is Beatriz, and I'm an LLM student here at the Harvard Law School. Currently writing a paper in a topic very related to this one. So for me, this is super interesting. And I actually have two questions. The first one uh, for Maria Eduarda. I was very curious on how did you define uh, misinformation or fake news in the paper? Because for some categories, it's obvious, right? Like disqualifying a particular candidate, making statements which are obviously invented, but on others that you had uh, on the screen, for instance, like criticizing the electronic means of voting, the line is more gray there, right? So did you choose a definition? If And if you chose it, which is it? And the second question would be, um, which are the legal remedies uh, that the TSE is using in Brazil for people that are spreading fake news. We heard like that the ultimate punishment is uh, being prevented to run on the elections for a certain amount of time, but I'm wondering what are the other options that the court has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me just add one of the questions online to this. So, Buddha, when you address the first question, uh, online it's been asked that you, you mentioned that uh, uh, the right had uh, less volume on social media, but much more interaction. Uh, and the question is whether this phenomenon was also influenced by algorithmic recommendations, or uh, if there was any way to explain this. So I'll begin with the, the last question and then go to the first. Um, I think regarding the, the far right engagement, we could say that uh, those groups on social media, they are really focused on political content. And we, w when we look at, at the left, at the center, they were not, uh, of course, they talked about politics, but they were also concerned about science, uh, I don't know, celebrities. So, it was uh, much more decentralized than uh, with the far right. And the engagement was absolutely crazy. Like people just talked about this. So it was like they were kind of uh, digital warriors. So they were really, um, I don't know. And they and I think the, the thing is, when we talk about um, algorithms, uh, a lot this these digital platforms, they are mobilized by an economy fueled by clicks. So if more people engage with the, this content, it's better for them. So what engages more? A moderate content or something that, I don't know, you feel anger, uh, angry about it, or you feel kind of, I don't know, you feel fear. So if you feel angry, you have more chance to engage with this content. But if it's moderate, it's like, ah, I don't mind. Like, there's a lot of this. So I think that's one of the reasons why the, the, the far right had much more engagement, like these two reasons. And when we talk about uh, the legal remedies, I could say like a lot of those, but they were there were many penalties against the economic sponsors of the, those channels that were propagating uh, disinformation. Uh, the demonetization of YouTube sh channels, for example, uh, a lot of collective agreements, so th this program that I mentioned to combat this information, more than 150 partners, so uh, from social civil, uh, civil society, from uh, platforms, government, so I think these collective agreements, it's a uh, terrific legal, um, I don't know, solution maybe, and formal commitments, of course, uh, signed by those platforms. And lastly, uh, how we defined 
this misinformation and fake news, I think we uh, we got to the obvious. Like we didn't uh, try to to go to this gray area. Otherwise, it will be really difficult to say what is true, what is not true. But the, um, mainly the narratives that were already recognized as disinformation by the TSC or the TSF, the DSTF. So we went to this direction. Yeah. Removed by similarity, which was right. the TSC removed by similarity content. Right? Yeah. yeah. Back. Exactly. Oh, okay. This is the last question that you read online. Uh, uh, yes, and then I, maybe we can take one last question here from the audience. I think Rex, you had one. Oh. Right? Oh. Uh, well, it, it relates to the relationship. Just between, get the mic to you. Between various <coughs> countries. So, as you know, in, in my, I'm Rex Ryan Middlesworth. I'm with the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative studying American democracy issues. Um, and uh, as you may know, our experience with having a uh, uh, misinformation governance board uh, went down in flames here with Orwellian comparisons and we don't seem to have the political will. So we look to Brazil and Europe and because it's expensive for platforms to have different rules for Europe than Brazil. And so have you seen any impact of the European regulations on what the platforms are doing in Brazil and do you hope for uh, maybe that we might benefit from what Brazil does here. Do you see them saying, if we do this for you, we have to do this everywhere? So, uh, David, why don't you start? Because you wanted to kind of no, complement yeah. the last answer. I'll go quickly. Um, yes, so this, as Natalia said before, this is the big tech company's big, biggest fear that that regulation in Brazil gets turned into a law then sets the precedent that countries all around the world will follow that same example and uh, enact the same kind of laws that hold these, back, uh, these big tech companies liable to the content that is shared on their platform, not only shared, but they also participate in distributed and also monetize. Uh, big tech companies have been way too comfortable hiding behind the Section 230 here in the United States. There are conversations uh, around taking it down, but it never goes anywhere. Uh, it was quite embarrassing when the Supreme Court had that hearing about Section 230, and then I can't remember which justice said that, but she said, well, we have nine people here that know the least about this. Our own Elena Kagan. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that is very concerning because these are the, the, the most powerful and influential companies in the world, and they act without any sort of regulation. Um, I think right um, there is a conversation around net neutrality that also is not going anywhere. Right now we have Tim Wu, uh, who uh, he was a professor at UVA and now he's a professor of law at Columbia and he's working with Biden and this uh, reformulation of the net neutrality to see if we can pass a certain regulation, but it seems like it's not going anywhere either. Um, there's a lot on, on domestic interest as well, because these are American companies. There's a lot that they bring back to the United States. So regulating them according to how countries in Europe and Brazil would regulate them may not be in the best interest of the United States, unfortunately. Um, so I'll be very curious to see how it goes forward. And to address real quickly the, the last question, we tend to focus too much on big techs uh, as these actors of spreading misinformation. But as I show in my research, I defined, I coined a term called the human infrastructure of misinformation. Uh, in Brazil, 99% of every smartphone is, uh, has WhatsApp, and that's basically where uh, misinformation gets spread in the country. And for you to get a message on WhatsApp, you need deliberate human action to send you a message so you can receive it. Uh, there's no algorithm behind WhatsApp to curate that sort of misinformation. So in, in the absence of a, an algorithm, a human infrastructure was put into place to not only produce, but to curate specific disinformation that would promote the sort of a negative commotion like anger and fear to get into people's WhatsApp groups, like church groups, soccer fan groups, family groups, and they would infiltrate those groups to make sure that these misinformation would get uh, um, spread wide and further, and you know, according to a, a, a research by uh, the University of Washington, was published in, this, in Science, this information tends to travel six times faster and wider than the truth or the fact check of that misinformation. 
So obviously it's a, it's sort of a battle that it's hard to be, but there's no silver bullet that requires a multifaceted approach to solve this problem. So we need regulation. We need uh, big techs to be liable to the content that they're monetizing and making money. We need researchers. We need the press, um, think tanks. So we need the whole society working together. We cannot just expect one social actor to solve the problem because it's just not going to happen. Thank you, David. And uh, I wanted to wrap up going back to uh, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, this technology is a tool for political action and can be used for good, for providing a voice for the oppressed, providing a voice for minorities, enabling civil participation, but it also can be you know, used for, for evil. Right, and that's what makes this topic so fascinating. We could be here for several more hours. Unfortunately, we're limited for time. So we'd like to thank David, Natalia, and Duda for a fantastic uh, panel. Uh, thank you, the audience uh, here and also in the web. And especially thank uh, Berkman Klein Center for hosting us uh, today. Luzo, I think you wanted to uh, just say a few words as we wrap up today. Just really quick saying thank you uh, for our uh, panelists. If we could get a round of applause. <laughs> to say that in the world of, in the game of policy and politics and internet, there is a f uh, four difficulties, easy, medium, hard, and Brazil, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I appreciate it a lot. I think that raised many topics. I think uh, regulating um, hate speech, the particularities and comparisons between the Brazilian legal system, the desire of users for uh, objectivity, which is a whole different metaphorical level, and also critiques of the mainstream media, how the mainstream media work that. So many threads of discourse that we can continue having throughout the academic year. I want to thank you very much for your uh, presence. This was the RSM. Uh, we're meeting every Wednesday with um, speakers, RSM speaker series every Wednesday until the end of this year, not the academic year, the 2023 year. And uh, our next event that I wanted to invite you to is uh, also moderated by Paolo uh, on AI uh, ethics, an interesting perspective. So same time, same place. One week from now, I'll see you all here. See you next time.